Hey everybody, welcome to Your Move, I'm Andy Stanley. So you're in a relationship and things are not going well. It's not what you hoped for, it's not what you dreamed of. So what do you do? Well, sometimes you just gotta throw things. That's right, you gotta throw things. Stick around and we'll talk about it right here on Your Move. So we are in part three of what do happy couples know? And so the question is, what do happy couples know? And here's what happy couples know. That over time, and sometimes initially, but oftentimes eventually, that our hopes, dreams, and desires become expectations. And they become expectations when we take our hopes, dreams, and desires, which seem so light and so happy and so tangible and so easily fulfilled, and we hand them to somebody else, and it feels like that. And then what was meant to be enjoyable becomes transactional. And when the, relationships becomes, when the relationship becomes transactional, it's not as much fun anymore because everybody's negotiating. And the problem with transactional is the best negotiator in the relationship always wins because it's a, no, a negotiation. So the best negotiator continues to win. He always wins, she always wins. I had my, my plan, I knew exactly what I was gonna say, I had my approach all planned out and uh, she won again, he won again. And the problem is in a relationship, when someone wins, the relationship loses. In a relationship, when I win, we loses. When you win, we loses. But the problem is we all bring this stuff into the relationship and we just can't help it. It's absolutely unavoidable. And it's not just you know, the kinds of stuff that you can put in a box, a lot of it is intangible. It's things that maybe you haven't thought through but they're kind of on the emotional, intangible, relational side of things. When you think about you know, future successful, happy relationships, you think about things like this, right? I mean, you wanna be respected, I do. You wanna be desired. You wanna be admired. I mean, as guys, we wanna, you know, whoever we spend our life with, we want them to think that we have what it takes. And the reason we want them to think we have what it takes is because about every other hour of every other day, we wonder if we have what it takes. But I want Sandra to think I have what it takes. We wanna be cherished, protected, defended. We wanna be trusted. I don't want somebody that's always checking up on me and I want somebody who's trustworthy. I wanna be prioritized. You don't wanna compete with his car. You know, you don't wanna compete with her job. You don't wanna compete with his income. You don't wanna compete with her family. You wanna be pursued, you wanna be attracted to. I mean, there's all these things and the list goes on and on and on. And these are good things. And these are good things. In fact, some of these things I think are a reflection of the image of God in us. So this isn't a good, bad thing. This is just a thing thing. But the question is, what do we do? And how do we handle this? This is just an ongoing relational dynamic. So today, What do we do with these? And the good news is Peter tells us. Now, Peter was a follower of Jesus, one of Jesus' original followers. In fact, some of the most famous stories in the New Testament have to do with Peter and all the cool things Peter did. He knew what Jesus taught, but he also knew what it was like to face extraordinary hardship. And so Peter tells us exactly what to do with all the things in our box because he gives us a relational principle that is not specific to marriage and specific to romantic relationships, but it certainly applies to those as we're about to see. Now, I ought to warn you though, what Peter says is a little weird, okay? And what Peter says may be a little uncomfortable for you. And what Peter says may just seem so religious, you're not sure you wanna embrace it. So I just wanna invite you, if you would, to put down your skepticism for just a few minutes, put down your objections for just a few minutes, and listen to the words of a man, come on, who knew Jesus. And besides that, the alternatives are worse. Because if you don't do what Peter says we should do with our hopes, dreams, and desires, what are you gonna do? I mean, what are your options, really? Just ignore them? Well, I, I, don't really, I, know, I don't really want that. I mean, I dreamed about it. I grew up thinking about it. I've had a picture in my mind. He promised, she promised, but I'm just gonna ignore those. That's unhealthy, right? What are you gonna do? Just give and 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 just not take care of yourself, not be concerned about yourself, not be honest with yourself. Over time, you're just gonna get worn out. You're gonna get weary. What is your other option? You can just stay busy, I guess. You know, just you know, pour more time into tennis, more time into golf, more time into work, more time into the kids, more time into hunting, something that just keeps you apart. So you just kind of show up like roommates, but that's not what you got into this for. So staying busy isn't, isn't an answer. Creating your own world isn't an answer. And besides that, this sets you up for the third option, which is I'm just gonna go find someone else. 
Now, if you're dating and you're just a few months in or a few weeks in, or you know, you're not engaged yet, you're just kind of moving in the direction of maybe a permanent relationship, and it dawns on you that your hopes, dreams, and desires are nothing like the person you're dating's hopes, dreams, and desires, then you probably should change relationships or maybe get out of that relationship because there's time and you have that opportunity. And this is very, very, very important. But if you're in a relationship, and especially and obviously if you're married, then simply getting out of the relationship oftentimes doesn't solve anything, and here's why. And this is, this is pretty deep, okay? Wherever you go, there you are. Let me go over that again, okay? Wherever you go, there you are. In other words, you go with you, and whatever part of the relationship problem you are, you're going to take that into your next relationship. And just because somebody else couldn't fulfill your hopes, dreams, and wishes, what makes you think you're gonna find somebody else who can, besides that, besides that. When you meet this other person, and you know this, but sometimes it's just good to hear somebody tell you. When you meet this other person, it feels so fresh and it's exciting and it stirs all that stuff that got stirred up the first time around. But this is generally not the answer. Again, here's, here's an observation that I promise I'm not gonna stay here too long. This is another message for another day, but just in case, this is for you. People don't rush into a new relationship because they're eager to give their lives to someone. In other words, the person that you're thinking about getting in a new relationship with, okay, you're not anxious for that new relationship because it's like, wow, I just wanna know what his or her hopes, dreams, and desires are. I need a new relationship so I can help somebody else fulfill their hopes, dreams, and desires. That's not why you're looking for something new. And by the way, that's not what they're looking for either. People don't jump into new relationships because they're trying to give their lives away. You know, the problem with my relationship is I just can't give my life to my husband. I can't give my life to my wife. I just can't give my life to my fiance. I gotta find somebody else. That's not what's going on, is it? I mean, come on, let's be adults. Let's be honest. You're hoping to get something that you aren't getting. And you should at least know that and you should be honest enough with yourself to acknowledge that. Which means, you're gonna hate me for this, but if you are dating someone who is recently divorced, time is your friend. If you are recently divorced and you're dating someone, time is your friend. But come on, let's be honest. Why do we rush into another relationship? It's not because we just wanna be selfless with someone new. Is it? No. It's because I got this dang box and I am tired of lugging it around and I'm ready to hand it to somebody new. Because I think she's gonna do it better, he's gonna do a better job. Now again, we don't think this way, but come on. Let's, if you're just, you just gotta be honest about this stuff, right? So the question is for today, what in the world do we do with this stuff? And as I said, Peter tells us, and in one of his letters that he wrote to Christians in the first century, he picks up on this, you know, put others first idea. So here's what Peter says, this is powerful. He says, all of you, that's all of you, all of you clothe yourselves, that is put on so that you're characterized by, all of you put on, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. It's a general relationship principle that we're gonna apply to romantic relationships in just a minute. In other words, clothe yourself with humility, that means go small. That means go others first. That means go to the back of the line. That means at every relationship iteration, at every point of decision, at every transition, anytime there's a potential conflict, here's what you're supposed to do. You should ask yourself, what would a humble person do? And you say, well, Andy, I'm not really humble. I know, that's why we're asking this question. Now, let me tell you a little, little secret about humility. If you start doing what a humble person does, you'll be humble. You go, oh no, it's an internal thing. It's not. See, you read your mind. You know if you're arrogant, but everybody else just reads your actions and actions speak louder than, exactly. So if you start doing what a humble person does, you'll be humble. And if you go, oh, I'm already humble. No, you're just reading your own thoughts. We're reading your actions, you're not. So stopping every once in a while, I'm telling you, this is a relational game changer and asking the question, okay, I know what I'm gearing up to do. I know what I normally do. I know how I feel. I know what happened last time. I know what my mama says, but you just stop and you go, okay. But if I were to go small, if I were to go into the line, if I were to put someone else first, what would that look like in this circumstance? What would a humble person do? Now, 
before you, you know, just turn me off, listen to how Peter finishes this statement. All of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another because, why humility, Peter? Because God opposes the proud. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, what would a humble, per in other words, do you really wanna be in opposition to God? In fact, some of you, you would say, the reason I don't believe, you know, I don't believe in God, I'm not so sure about a personal God. Part of it is, you know, you, you've stiff-armed God a little bit. And Peter, who knew Jesus, who was the son of God, said that God pulls back from proud people, that God leans away from and leans back from proud people. And before you judge God too harshly, that's what you do as well, right? I mean, you don't, you're, not, you're not drawn to arrogant people, right? Don't, don't you pull back? Don't you kind of resist entitled people, demanding people, people who are always trying to squeeze out of you whatever they can get out of you for their benefit and they only think about themselves and they rarely think about how their behavior impacts you? But look what he says. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor or grace. In fact, grace is actually a better translation of this word. He shows grace or favor to the humble. Now, this is an extraordinary promise and in the English text, it's a little hard to see how this is a promise, but here's what this means. The, Peter says that when you humble yourself in a relationship, it is an invitation for God to give you the strength you need, the endurance you need, the power you, you need to maintain and to do the right thing. Because humility is an invitation to God. Humility is an invitation to God. Humility throughout the Old and New Testament, humility, and perhaps you've experienced that, humility, when we go small, when we go back of the line, when we go others first, it is an invitation for God to do something extraordinary in our lives and in our relationships. So he says this, let me say it again a different way, Peter says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, not under God's mighty hand like gotcha, not that kind of under God's mighty hand. To be under God's mighty hand is to be under the canopy of his protection, is to be under the canopy of his authority. He says, when you go humble, you are basically backing into the safest place you could be because God leans in to the humble. God leans toward the person that says, what is the humble thing to do? What would a humble person do when she says, when he says, when he doesn't, and when she does? And this is an imperative. It's when you wanna power up, when you wanna get demanding, when you wanna defend, he says, nope. Ask what would a humble person do? And then you just do that. And not only are you under God's mighty hand, he's about to say, you're also in God's mighty hand. So it's not only under authority, it's not only under protection, it's in a place to where when God is ready, he can do something extraordinary for you. And that brings us to the second promise, that or the purpose or the result that he may lift you up because you're in his mighty hand. God, I, I've done the humble thing, I've done the submissive thing, I've done the, you know, I've done the others first thing, I've placed myself in your mighty hand, and God says, and when the time comes, when the time is right, you've put yourself in a position to where I can lift you up. Now, you hear all that and you think, okay, I'm sure that makes perfect sense to you, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> what does this even mean? So I think when Peter was writing this, this made perfect sense to him because of the context and culture he was in. I think he's writing this and he realizes, okay, this is probably way over everybody's head. So I need to give him some handles. I need, to, I need to explain exactly what I'm talking about. What does it mean to go humble? What does it mean to put others first in this context? So we're gonna look at what Peter says within the context now of relationships, personal, romantic, relationships. And here's what Peter says. This is incredible. He says, I'm inviting you because I spent time with Jesus. And so speaking on behalf of Jesus, the son of God, he says, I'm inviting you, check this out. He says, cast all your anxiety, all your frustrations, all your, she said, he said, I thought, I always thought it was going to be, I always dreamed it would be, they promised, cast all of your anxiety on him. Talking about God in whose mighty hand you stand and under whose mighty hand you dwell. Cast all your anxiety on him. In other words, don't miss this. This is an invitation for you to unload on God. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, instead of trying to get, you know, your significant other or whoever it is you're in love with to carry this stuff around, he says, I want you to cast it. I want you to hurl it. I want you to fling it towards your heavenly father. All your anxieties, all your cares, 
all your frustrations, all your unfulfilled dreams, all your he promised and she said, and I believed and I thought, and I thought we'd talk that through and I thought we'd agreed upon. Peter says, okay, before you take it to them, take it to him. Cast all of it on your heavenly father. Wow. Now, here's where you're gonna struggle with this. And so I'm gonna kind of bear down a little bit, okay? Maybe uncomfortably. You've got to stop praying polite prayers, okay? You, no, don't pray polite prayers. Don't pray formal prayers, okay? Stop praying formal prayers as well. In fact, I, sometimes I talk to people and it's like, well, you know, Andy, you know, I, I used to pray. I don't know how to pray. I'm like, uh, y- yes, you do. And here's how I know that. Because you need to pray f- honest prayers. And everybody knows how to pray an honest prayer. You may have never prayed one because you were afraid or because you memorized prayers as a child or because the only prayers you pray are behind the steering wheel or while you're putting on makeup or at the meal. But Peter's like, okay, forget all that. I'm talking about some different kind of praying. I want you to get honest. In fact, when it comes to praying about this kind of stuff, you're gonna take all this energy somewhere. Start with your father in heaven, not the guy down the hall not your wife in the other room. Don't wait for that garage door to open and get ready to unload your hopes, dreams, and desires. You start with your Father in heaven and you pray this out loud. Now, Peter didn't make this whole cast your cares on the Lord thing up. He actually lifted this from one of David's Psalms written hundreds of years earlier. So because I know some of you have never prayed honest prayers, again, you say, well, I don't know how to pray. You do know how to pray. You just haven't done it like this. Because if you've ever been mad, you know how to pray. If you've ever lost your temper, you know how to pray. If you've ever told someone off, you know how to pray. That's, what, that's part of what praying is. And, and the thing is, Peter, uh, this is powerful. You see, one day Peter and, and the guys, the disciples, they, were, they would watch Jesus go away and pray, and then they would pray and, and they would look at each other and they would say, I don't think we're doing it right. Now, these were Jewish boys who'd memorized all kinds of prayers, but they would watch Jesus pray and they were like, I, it's different, I mean, it's like he's over there in a wrestling match. I mean, he gets kind of loud. I think we should move further away, right? I don't know if we should overhear this. And so one day they went to Jesus. This was their praying and his praying were so different. One day they went to Jesus and they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. Which means we've been praying. We don't pray like you. We don't think we're doing it right. So all these years later, Peter says, okay, I learned a few things about prayer. Unload on your father in heaven. Cast, throw, fling it all at him. So anyway, he lifts this little phrase out of the Psalm of David, getting back to that. And so what I wanna do real quickly, I wanna read you a bit of this Psalm where he got this because it's a great example of what I'm talking about. Now, when David would write, he's a poet, he's a warrior. I mean, he's been covered in the blood of his enemy. I mean, he's a king, he's a shepherd, been there, done that. He's an adulterer, he's forgiven. I mean, he's a father, he's a grandfather. He's all these different roles. And yet time after time after time, he would recenter himself on his relationship with God and he would write his prayers. And his prayers were kind of like journals and prayers and rants all mixed together. And God, (laughs) the scripture says he was a man after God's own heart. So I think we all have permission to do this. So here's an example of what I'm talking about, okay? This is David. If an enemy, not a friend, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. That's what enemies do. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, he's writing this down. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend. I can't believe he would do this. I can't believe she would do this. I can't believe they've turned on me with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God. We used to go to church together. As we walked about among the worshipers and people thought, oh, look how they're such a lovely couple. Oh, they get along. And it's like, I can't believe it's happening to me. Let, check this out, let death, be honest, Dave. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead for evil finds lodging among them. Ooh, can you say that to God? Do you know what the English equivalent of this is? To hell with them. That's what that means, to hell with them. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Ooh>, okay. <clears throat> he keeps going. As for me, I call to God and the Lord saves me. Now check this out, okay, this is so powerful. 
not behind the steering wheel on the way to work, not while I'm putting on my makeup, not while I'm you know, getting dressed and having a thought prayer. Evening, morning, and noon, evening, morning, and noon, evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress and he hears my thoughts. He hears my voice. David's saying, sometimes I'm so desperate and frustrated, I pray three times a day and I pray loud and they are not polite prayers. Wow. And as a result, he rescues me. He rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me. It's like a war, he says. Even though many oppose me, God love this God who is enthroned, he lifts his eyes off of his circumstances, off these relationships. God who is enthroned from of old, who does not change, he will hear them and humble them because they have no fear of God. God's gonna get my enemies. And then David kind of regathers himself, recenters himself. And he makes this statement that Peter lifts up and uses in the New Testament years later. He says this, cast, here it is, cast, throw, hurl, fling your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken or he will never let the righteous be brought down. But you, he's not done, but you God, will bring down, I might not be brought down, the, uh, the righteous may not be brought down, but you God will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay. The bloodthirsty and deceitful will not live out half their days. Ooh. See, that's not nice, is it? You know what that is? That's honest. You ever prayed like that? I know you've unleashed hell on you know, the person you're living with or your husband or your wife, or you, know, you just kind of, I'm gonna tell you one more time, you know, you've, you've done that, but have you ever talked to God that way? You're like, I didn't know we could talk to God that way. Look, if you've never been that honest with God, my friends, you've never opened your heart completely to God. He doesn't want polite, he wants you. And that's part of humility. It's heart wide open. God, I am so frustrated. I am so fed up. I am so done. I am so over it. I, I, God, I wish I'd never met him. I wish I'd never married her. I wish I'd never slept with him. Well, there's that. Okay, I, 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 I wish I'd never met him. You know, I, I, I'm so, I'm just so over it. And I need you because I don't know what to do. I mean, this isn't unrealistic. We talked about this. God, I need you. And here's the thing, and I understand this. If you didn't have permission to be that honest with your parents growing up, especially with your father, don't you talk to me that way, you know, one of those deals, this is gonna be hard for you. And I've been doing this a long time, and when my kids hit that age where they just had some things to say, I, I told Sandra, it's okay. I am honored, and I, I always tell them when they would just lose it at me, on me, because of me, whatever it might be, I would just absorb it. And when they were finished, I would say, thank you. Thank you for honoring me with what's inside of you. And you're thinking, you're making that up. You didn't do that with your teenage kids. <laughs> yes, I did. And you know why I did it? Because I've known for a long, long time that my father in heaven invites that kind of feedback from me, even when I'm wrong, even when I'm misguided, even when I don't see the world the way the world really is. And I decided a long time ago before my kids ever hit adolescence, you know what? I would rather br them bring it to me fearlessly than to shut it down and let all that energy go somewhere else. But here's the best part of all. This is so powerful. And if you've been away from church for a long time or you've been out of church for a long time or you're skeptical, I, I get that. If I were you, I would be as skeptical as you are. But if you're the least bit open, this next part, this is gold, this is so powerful. He says, cast your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That's why. The reason you can bring it, the reason he's not offended, the reason he's not gonna shut you down, the reason he's not gonna be like, whoa, we don't use that kind of language, you know, is because he cares for you. Listen, if it's important to you, it is important to your father in heaven. That's how good fathers are, right? If it's important to you, it is important to your father in heaven because you are important to your father in heaven. And Peter saw this in Jesus. 
I mean, come on, Peter really saw it. Because there at the end, Peter was exactly like the friend in David's psalm. He spent three years with Jesus and saw it all, did it all, walked on water, did the whole deal. And at the end, he betrayed his friend. And in the end, Jesus took him back. He didn't just take him back. He put him in charge of the whole enterprise. Peter knew God can handle it. God can take it. You are invited to bring it. Again, you're gonna unload this somewhere. Your heavenly father says, start with me. Start with me. Get on your knees every day and just give me your list. Give me your box. Give me your expectations. Give me your disappointment. Give me your heartbreak. Give me all the things he or she promised or the things that aren't working out. I'm telling you, bring them to me every single day because that is an expression of humility. And humility is an invitation for God to do something remarkable. But I gotta warn you, the first remarkable thing God does will not be in the person down the hall. The first remarkable thing God does, if you do this, will be in you. In fact, you'll begin to see this box differently. You'll begin to see some of the things in this box differently. Chances are you'll take some things out of the box. You may discover that you've been trying to squeeze something out of your husband or your wife or fiance that was never in them to give in the first place and that they weren't created to give you in the first place. And you may discover that you both really hope for and dream of and wish for the very same thing. But that transformation will never happen as long as you're taking it to them first. And so your heavenly father says, I invite you. No more happy prayers, no more polite prayers, no more, you know, go through all the, just, just bring it to me. You see, happy couples know, happy couples know that hopes, wishes, and dreams, and hopes, dreams, and desires quickly become expectations, and happy couples know that they just have to decide the other person doesn't owe me anything. Happy couples know that it's a submission competition, that it is a race to the back of the line. And happy couples know that sometimes, 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 you have to throw things. 